Dear Thai, dear Sangha, today is Sunday 14 of June 2020. And uh, well, of course, I'm nervous about being here up here with you, but I'm also uh, happy and looking forward to the fact that I can talk about my practice to the communities the very first time I speak with the brothers, to the brothers. So it's a, it's a precious opportunity to let you know what I do in my practice time and in my sitting time and what happens in, within my mind and heart. And, um, and I feel very privileged to be here. And I think we are all very privileged actually to, to, have, met, uh, to have met this path. Just before coming in, I was uh, sharing with a brother on the path. And, and it was, we were talking about how sometimes we have in the impression in the mind we have understood things and we have kind of a clear map of how things are supposed to work. But in reality, it doesn't seem to work. You know, the transformation doesn't happen. Transformation doesn't yet happen or manifest. I... Well, I think I, I work in maintenance and construction, so the way I see this talk is like a user manual and troubleshooting with a long troubleshooting section of the practice. But actually, I like to reflect that there is much more to it, you know, that we may have all this layout of how to do, and from this step you go there, and then you do this. And yet, it's still a mystery. Practice is still, a, our mind is still a mystery, and, uh, and it's very beautiful to just uh, dwell in the, in the sense of like, I'm doing my best and yet, and yet things have, haven't yet transformed till I, I feel nervous about giving a talk and making a fool of myself or I am, you know, get angry and this and that. And um, so maybe the first thing we can uh, give a little love to ourselves and say, it's okay, we, we are working on it and uh, may take some time and uh, may start by giving love to ourselves right, right away. If we wait for it to be done, uh, it may be a long time before we love ourselves. My very first um, passion or, uh, on this path, it was actually the first time I, I sat on a cushion. And uh, at first it was through some books. And, uh, and, and the, the instruction on the book, just say, sit and, and watch, watch your breath. And, um, and not, nothing really happened that time. It wasn't like any reveal, revelation, but it was definitely like a love at first sight. It was like something that was very, it's funny, like in, in a way, like the fact that I could sit and watch myself, it never occurred to me. The fact that I could like make the step back and watch, watch what's happening inside. And actually, there was a good direction to go to, but then I feel like I went stray and stray and far, and I kind of I, I had a lot of misunderstandings about what, what the practice was and what meditation was. Uh, my first uh, tradition it was one that focused very much on sitting. And the instruction I was given was be, be, be with the breath. And, uh, and looking at it now, it seems funny, but I, somehow I thought that just being with the breath, it would, something would happen. Like if I stay long enough with the breath, then, I don't know, I'll, life will transform, I will transform, or I'll become enlightened. I don't know what would happen, but my, my, my focus was to stay with the breath, no matter, no matter what. And um, that wasn't so good. That did a lot of, um, I think I lost perspective on what, or what, was, uh, what was the goal and what was the, the process that was going on. I'm going to write a few things on the board. I'm 
sure you know what I'm writing here. So as you probably all recognize, this is the basic structure of a Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundation of mindfulness. And the very first one is the body. And the very first one in the body is the breath. But actually in the Sutra, before we come to this to this structure. There is another part that is, to me, has been a, a revelation because I hadn't understood. You say how the mind should be. Anybody? So it says, diligent, clearly knowing, mindful, Having let go, craving, and distaste. I think he says for distaste, for this life, for distaste, uh, for the world. So I think what I was doing, I was trying to be with the breath, and I was uh, probably being diligent enough. I was putting a lot of effort into it. And uh, in culture, I don't think that's really our problem. And in culture, we are, we are been trained to put a lot of effort into things. And I was sort of trying to be mindful. I had chosen the breath, and I was really trying to be with the breath. Um, what I think it was lacking it was uh, how, how this was affecting me. And this is one thing that I, I, I came across in the Satipatthana, that it really, it really fascinated me, the fact they doesn't say just stay with the breath. That the whole the whole path, the whole four steps, they, they work together. So the moment I'm staying with the breath, I need to be aware of what's happening in the background, what's happening in my mind. Uh, how is being the breath affecting my mind? And uh, having let let go, craving and distaste is also tells a lot about my my motivation in the moment. Like I said, this is, we can be part-time Buddhas. I find if you're ready, we are in the, in the mind state, which is kind of step one on the path of the Satipatthana. It is kind of a part-time Buddha. You know, if you're already diligent, clearly knowing, mindful, and letting, letting go, craving a distaste, it's like, done. You know, what else, what else do I need to do? And, uh, and it's true, like we, we all have experienced those moments of clarity and being settled and being clear on what's, uh, what's in front of us. Um, but too bad they don't last those moments, you know, they, they may last for a moment and then, and then they go. But, um, but it's nice to keep that as a, as a compass. This is what we are aiming to. So whatever the object that we decide to work with, uh, it's crucial to see how it's affecting us, and is it helping me stay, stay in that zone of, uh, of, of clarity, of presence, of uh, clear effort, clear um, in intention in what I'm practicing with, and with a motivation that is not based on greed and aversion, but in a motivation that is engaging me with what's in front of myself, what's, what I'm observing. So when I stay with the breath, it's not so much about the breath. It's how my relationship to the breath affects, affects this, this 
this body-mind. And then, I think the breath itself actually says a lot, because the breath, well, you know these two, it says, in, out, long, short, Then he says, aware of the whole body. And then he says, relax. The whole body. So again, this I found it was very interesting because this is, he doesn't say stay with the breath and uh, and ignore what's happening around you. It doesn't say you stay with the breath and uh, cut yourself off from the rest of the experience of being alive. Uh, to me, what he says, he says, open up, open up your, uh, uh, your awareness, what you're looking at, so that you can include the whole body. Uh, there are different practices in Buddhist meditation. There are different practices in non-Buddhist meditation, so I don't want to say that this is the way, but this definitely points, points to something, points to a, a, certain kind of, a certain kind of awareness, a certain kind of presence. A presence that is able to, to stay with the object, let's say the breath, that, since that's what we are talking about. But it doesn't let the object separate myself from the rest of the experience. I can be with the breath, and I can be with the whole body breathing. I can be with the breath, and I need to be aware of how, how is the object uh, impacting my mind. I keep adding pieces. Well, we'll put more. So I put a couple extra couple pieces there. Posture activities. Um, I think those they go in the same direction. Like uh, we we all know that the practice is not something happens in the hall. The happens is something that happens through the day. Well, what does that mean? It means that I, I need to develop a sort of an attention that I'm able to actually bring outside, outside of this all. I need to be able to, to bring a sort of attention that it can include how my body is positioned and what am I doing through the day. What I did when I started practicing and tried to be with the breath, I felt like uh, that's what I needed to be all the time. And um, to the point that I, some, I remember at some point walking, and because I was walking, I, I couldn't really feel the breath, so I started even like forcing the breath so that I could feel it more clearly. And now I think, well, this was uh, madness, but at the time it really seemed like a good idea to, to do that. Um, if, if, if I define my practice too narrow, what, what is it? The practice is I need to feel the belly rising and falling. Uh, I'm putting myself in trouble because there's moments I will be able to do that and there's moments I, I will not be able to do that. Uh, if I need to be aware of my belly rising and falling while I'm mowing the lawn, I hear landscaping team, it's probably very difficult because uh, there's too many things going on. Uh, so I need, I need to be able to, to have a more flexible definition of the practice that allows me to include, include the object that are suitable to the conditions and to my own uh, mind state. And the Buddha here clear, it gives clear instruction, you know, you, you, 
when you sit, you can be aware of the breath and you can uh, calm the, calm the, be aware of the whole body and calm the body. And yet, when there is more activities, you probably need to shift, to shift the focus of attention to something that can be included. And yet, we want to keep the same mind attitude, the same mind attitude that is not driven by uh, aversion, is not driven by greed, that is uh, mindful, is able to, to be in contact with the object that, that we have chosen, that we are working with. You all have experience in sitting, so you probably all experience coming to the meditation hall and one object that really works well one day the following day, the day has been different, your mind is different, you come there and I don't know how to be with the breath. I cannot feel my breath. Maybe the day before I stay with my chest and it felt great and the next day I don't even know if I have a chest or not. It's, it's, not, it's not there. Uh, the, so, so how do we relate to it? We cannot define the practice as a certain experience. This is the practice, this is not the practice. Rather, I would say, how do I relate to the situation I'm in right now in a way that allows me to be in contact with, with what I, I can be in contact? If the mind is really calm, then I'd probably be able to be in contact with something very subtle, with something that, that I may not be able to be in contact when my mind is too agitated or there's some strong emotions going on. So I would say that, again, the, the main, the main, the main, uh, con the main point of practice is how how can I relate to this present moment as as it is, and um, and, and making experience in practice over time. I think we um, it's not that we learn to only like select certain moments and force our life into those moments, and every moment is a you know it's a moment of calm, it's a moment of stillness. But it's rather how can I recognize what's where I'm at, what's in front of me, and how can I find uh, tools to to be with it and to lead it in a in a positive way, if you want. You know, there may be a certain emotions. How can I work with it so it doesn't take over, so it doesn't uh, uh, lead me lead me in uh, unwholesome directions? But rather, how do I meet what's in front of me, stay with it, so that it it, you know, it comes towards peace, it comes towards uh, understanding. So we want to, we set the intention of being uh, mindful throughout the day. I remember when I read on the books first, when I was still at university, oh, you should follow your breath through the day. And I was like, oh, this sounds great, I'll, I'll do that. And then I would leave to go to, sc to school, to university. And, and, and I would forget about it. And I remember coming back, coming back on the bus, and I was like, wow, the whole day has gone by, and I, not even a moment of awareness to the bear to the breath. Um, so the, the intention is not enough. The, the willpower surely is not enough. We have many, many conditions which support us, especially here in Plum Village. And yet we also need to, to have clarity of what's within our reach. Um, I'm thinking of uh, service meditation, for example. And uh, if my task is a difficult one to be in front of a screen, that is a really challenging, uh, really challenging experience to try to be mindful and be in front of a screen. Uh, whatever involves a lot of head work, I find it very, very difficult to, to be in, in, in this rooted uh, kind of embodied presence. Um, so so we, we, 
when we need to experiment, but I think what we need to do is start kind of tracing this line of what is still within the realm of practice and what is gone astray, what has gone too far, what is not practice anymore. Uh, again, practice cannot just be, be peacefully on the cushion. This would not be realistic. Uh, I can be angry and practice. There is not conflict there, not necessarily conflict there. But if, if whatever is stimulating me is, is, is so strong or it's so uh, appealing to me that I, I lose the sense of presence, the kind of seeing the object and having perspective on the fact that I'm seeing the object, then, then it's not practice anymore. And I wouldn't define it as practice anymore. I mean, it may be interesting psychological exercise. It may be, you know, I challenge myself to do something new. It's all good. But in terms of satipatthana practice, at least, I'll define practice when there is the sense of presence. When I, I know the object I'm with, let's say the breath, and there is the, the sense of uh, perspective on it. I know I am observing the object. I am aware of the object, and I am aware how the object is influencing my mind. I can be with the breath, and I can be with the whole body at once. And it's interesting that the mind, the sense of awareness is not it's not a laser beam, you know, it's not one, one, one object, I just stay with that, that there is this sense of spaciousness that I can encompass the breath and the body and the mind. Clearly knowing the second, uh, the second down there uh, is uh, Sampajana in Pali. And it's, uh, it means being uh, like having a, I would say a, a perspective on, 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 on where things lead to, you know, like a distinction of wholesome and unwholesome, a distinction of how things are impacting us and, and, and where is it leading. So we cannot just be aware of the object and, and say, oh, there is, there is an emotion, and, but I need to know, is this, where is this leading to? And, and then I can... I can choose, oh, this is leading towards peace, towards clarity, I'll cultivate this. This is leading towards uh, aversion, towards anger, towards uh, uh, strengthening my self-identity. It's like, oh, maybe I don't, need to, um, I don't need to follow that. Maybe I'd like to say a few words about the second, uh, the second of the four satipatthana, which is feelings. Before getting to it, I guess what, what I really like of the Satipatthana is that it gave me a, a, big, a big toolbox. There is a lot of tools in there. And uh, so when I started off practicing just the breath, I stay with the breath, I, I was using only one tool. A good one maybe, stay with the breath, but it wasn't enough to, to really let me work on, on a project of, of this project, right? But then the Satipatthana gives a lot of tools for different occasions, for different uh, situations. And, um, and some are tools of uh, investigation, if you want. And some are tools of uh, exploring new territory. And some are kind of big question marks to challenge ourselves. We'll, we'll get to it in a moment. But I would say feeling is, to me, is like a, an, an investigation tool, I'll call it. Uh, so feelings that we are talking here, just to clarify, this is not yet quite emotions. Uh, this is a simpler, a simpler object. Is what, I'm, what, what answer to the question, how, how does it feel? And, uh, and we can ask the question right now to ourselves, you know, how, how does this feel? In general, to be sitting here, how, how does it feel? And the answer is good bad, or somewhere in between. Right? So nothing complex. There is no story, there is nothing to it. Just what, what comes up. And you can answer even to like specific parts. How, how does my belly feel? How does it feel to be in the belly? Feels pleasant? Feels unpleasant? Feels... Eh. 
How does it feel my general state of being? Does it feel good in this moment or not so good? So in a way, it's not really a different object than what we had before. Before we had the body, right? We, we stay with the body and we recognize the body and we just dwell in the presence of, of, of the sensations of the body. Yet now I think we are adding a, a significant ingredient. We are adding a kind of a feeling tone to it, which doesn't involve me. It doesn't involve my childhood, my story. It doesn't involve my gender or who I think I am. I'm Italian or whatever. It just says, "How how does this feel?" It's very it's a very immediate immediate uh, answer that we receive. How does it feel? And yet this is such an important uh, component because this is what we often react to, to this, uh, to this sense of pleasant, unpleasant, then we immediately, eh, I want it, eh, I don't want it. But simply, so often it's so fast that I don't see, I don't see coming up, I have a, you say something, I react right away, I feel hurt, I feel I don't want it, I don't like it, I snap back. Uh, so that's why I said this is an investigation tool. This is kind of a, a probe to, to, to look a little deeper into things and try to uh, tease them apart and try to see, oh, what, what, what's really happening in there? Why, when I'm angry, I'm so fidgety and I cannot sit and I cannot... What, what is it really that I'm reacting to? And a lot of what it boils down to is this feeling. It's like, it doesn't feel good. I don't like to, to, to sit like this. I don't like to sit and feel this sensation. I also like that this, this feeling is uh, being so immediate and so unfiltered. It doesn't really allow us uh, much, uh, much speculation, much justification, much, you know, just like, oh, that's how it feels. And, and when things don't feel good, I feel, I, I feel for myself. I, I, there is a sense of like, oh, it hurts. To be with a difficult mental state, a difficult emotional state, it can, it can just be very, very unpleasant, very painful. And just being with, with, with feeling, with Vedanas, the, there is no filter there. Um, it's just me and how things feel. Or oh, me, not even whatever you want to say, but just just that, just this experience of, of how things feel. I found that's a very good entry door for a sense of kindness towards ourselves in this uh, experience of being alive. You know, when things don't feel good, it's just like okay, can I can I just kind of soften up, open up, and be and be with this with this experience. And that's also a good entry door to a sense of compassion for others. Because when things don't feel good, I know they don't feel good. And when I see somebody else in that state, things don't feel good, I know how they feel. And then as human being, we have this experience of the mind. We can create all this story and narratives and but actually, the experience is just that. You know, can I put all the narrative aside and just say, oh, wow, that's how it feels. This is also so important because it allows us to, to realize what's going on in a very immediate manner, so in, a, in, a, in a way that throughout the day we can recognize right away. coming back to being aware throughout the day. Uh, as soon as something impacts me strongly, it's very good to have a, 
an anchor that like, wow, this feels either very good or very bad, but it feels very strong. And, and when things feel very strong, they have the power to pull us away from, from this sense of presence, this sense of being, uh, being in this perspective of me, the object. Well, me, I mean, me is the sitting, but the sense of the object and how the object is touching me. So to have this anchor of uh, feeling is very useful because when something comes up, uh, if I'm trained, if I'm used to recognize these feelings, I'm like, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is powerful. The third, the third satipatthana is the mind. This is a big, a big domain, of course. The mind is uh, a lot of our experience. Um, the way it's, it's said in the sutra is, uh, what does he even say? He says, I'm aware when anger is there and I'm aware when anger is not there. I'm aware when Lust is there, and I'm aware when lust is not there. I'm aware when delusion is there. And uh, it says uh, a contracting mind, an expanding mind. And, um, it, it, it pretty much says, I'm aware of whatever state my mind is in. This can be a very I mean, all this exercise can be, of course, practiced while we are sitting. You know, um, I am. Uh, I can choose the breath as the as the base. But I don't even have to. And then I see. I I see how the mind is. How is my mind in this moment? Is my mind spacious? Is it contracted? Is there anger? Or oh, there is no anger. Is it greed or no greed? And it's interesting that, that it doesn't just say, I'm aware if there is greed, and that's it. It says, I'm also aware when there is no greed. So again, what we are doing is really trying to develop a, a, felt, a felt sense to recognize these different states. And, uh, and the way we train in, uh, on the path is not to like tell us some, some lofty ideal that we want to aim towards and I should be, but we really, we train in a very instinctive way, I want to say, you know, like attach a hot pot and, and that, that hurts, it burns. You don't need to tell me, oh, don't touch it, it burn and this and that. I touch it, I feel it, I know right away, it, it, it burns. And I don't want to touch it again. And, and that's how we train on the path. We pay close attention to the experience so that we actually see how it feels. I think the problem often is we have so many ideas how things should be or what we want or what we are going towards that we don't really pay enough attention to how things feel right in front of us. And therefore we miss the opportunity to, to learn from it. So what we do here, we really pay close attention, and then, wow, a mind full of hatred, it doesn't feel good at all. A mind that is envious, it doesn't feel good at all. A loving mind, oh, that feels nice. Oh, that's cozy and warm, and I like that. But I don't need to think so much about it. I, I know, I feel it, I feel like, oh, yeah, kindness, ooh, nice. Mm. And so I learned at a very kind of low, low level, if you want, you know, as, uh, 
nobody needs to tell me what's right and what's wrong. I learn it directly from the experience of what's uh, what's kindness, what's empathy, what's uh, uh, being uh, loving and inclusive. But of course, the mind is so tricky. When, if I just want to be with the mind, I can fall in all sorts of story, mostly me-related. Me oh, this is me. Yes, I know I'm an introvert. I'm shy. Yes, that's why I don't like to give a talk. And this, this, this. But how does it feel? You know, can I? That's why we have these previous steps. They give us a very concrete anchor to 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 be with what's happening. Oh, what's the feeling connected to this? Oh, okay. That's the feeling. Am I into that? Me? Am I sense of me? No, it's not. Oh, that's a loving mind. That's an angry mind. Am I into that? No. Not on the felt sense. Oh, that's how a loving mind feels. That's how an angry mind feels. We may start to practice thinking that we want to... I'll say the the default program I was raised with is try to get things right so that I can finally be happy and have things going my way. I may be the only one with this program, but and uh, and coming to the practice, we we may translate the same program into the practice. Oh, if only my meditation they get steadily better, and then finally I'll be able to to be happy and live my life. Well, the bad news is that doesn't work because we try with the meditation and it's a roller coaster. Uh, the good news is that, that we don't need to listen to this program, that we can learn through this roller coaster. I, I did a six weeks of silence, and I, just yesterday I was pulling out my journal that I wrote through this, uh, through this retreat. And, and was, what was left from the retreat in my memory was all these kind of highlights, you know, the highlights of the retreat of this beautiful day and this great meditation and this. And then it was very sobering yesterday to lead, read this journal because it was like day 39. Oh, it was a hell, a realm. I was like, oh God, really? Like after. <laughs> and, uh, and it's very tempting. It's very tempting to, to cling to something, to cling to, oh, I'm learning to meditate. Oh, I learned all these techniques and finally I'll be in control of my life. And it was very sobering to see, no, that, that is not true. Mm-hmm. Uh, 39 days into silence, I was suffering horribly. And, and, and then the next day was interesting again. And then, I mean, it was, there was a lot into it. I'm actually very happy that that doesn't work because I think I will get myself into a lot of trouble if, if, if things will go my way. I think what we, what we are approaching to is like start to change the perspective on how we relate to the practice, to the satipatthana, if you want, but through the practice, it surely is not anymore a controlling tool. It's not anymore something I can use in order to achieve my goal of being a certain person or having things go a certain way. Rather, it becomes a tool to see how things work inside of myself how things work inside of myself. And then the good news is that I do have some some sort of, I wouldn't say control, but I can influence somewhat how things go. So I can choose what to encourage and what not to encourage. That's why we come back to the Sampajana. The Sampajana is important because I learn what I want to encourage, what leads me towards wholesomeness and what doesn't. Should we add a few, a few more things in there? I'll just put hindrances down here.
that's all I'm going to put. There is more, but we'll leave it for the next Dhamma talk. Should we write what, what the hindrances are? So there is five of them. There is a f sensual desire. There is um, aversion, let's put aversion. There is a uh, torpor. Is there age? I don't know. Torpor, dullness. There is uh, restlessness. And there is doubt. <laughs> Talking about not having control, um, we sit down or we establish our mindfulness with the best intention. And then we find ourselves into one of those hell realms of, uh, of hindrances. It takes a lot of, uh, I'll say, a lot of uh, kindness to, to, to be there. Because sometimes the discrepancy between the intention and our hope and the miserable reality in front of us is so stark that it's like, wow. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to be this uh, super Buddha flying in the sky and I'm sitting there, you know, suffering in my doubts and am I good enough? I cannot do it and I'm flawed, you know, all this. Or oh, I go into daydreaming, you know, food, sex, whatever you want, you know, feels good. Or oh, into my hurt story, why did they do this to me? Restlessness, actually it's associated also with regret. They put restlessness and regret. Things of the past, that have yet to be resolved, that I wish hadn't happened. Oh, I turn off dullness. Actually, there was a mistake I did for, I say, a number of years. Dullness was why my go-to escape mechanism. Uh, when I was saying that I would be with the breath, but I wouldn't see how the breath was affecting me. That's actually what was happening. But it took me long to understand. It was. I was trying too much to be with the breath, and I put so much effort that actually only my willpower was there, and the rest of me was somewhere lagging behind. And then all would happen, I would just turn off. And, uh, but having, not having this perspective of, of, of what, what was happening in the mind, it was really preventing me from recognizing this mechanism. That's why it's so dear, so dear to me, because actually I, I feel like I waste a number of hours of cushion practice, uh, not recognizing what, what the mind, what state the mind was in. <coughs> so the first instruction we receive when we see these hindrances, when we start to, re to recognize the state of our mind is, leave it there, come back, come back to the object. But of course it's not as easy all the time, and uh, it doesn't work all the time. Mm. And actually, I like to, to put them a little in perspective because it seems like even the, the name, the hindrances, right? That there are these obstacles that I need to get rid of. And, and there is a certain point to it, of course. They're, but, but they're not an obstacle between me and the practice. They, they are the practice. They're there for me to practice with. 
so I need to relate to the states, to, to this experience in a way that is not like, oh, why, why are you there? You shouldn't be there. I, I'll use all my tools to get rid of you as quick as I can so I can go back to the peaceful state. But it's like, how can I relate to this in a way that is um, loving, for sure, kind to myself, and embracing the fact that the hindrance is there. Not dwelling in it, if I'm daydreaming about you know, what I'm going to eat for dinner, that's, that's a waste of time. But if I develop a version for it, it's even more waste of time. And at times, we have so many unresolved in our life that just want it to go away, just it will not work. I need to bring in the mention of uh, sensitivity. And I would say this is true for throughout the practice, sensitivity, it's a, a path to sensitivity. And, and the mention of, um, oh, how do I relate to this with kindness? Again, we can rely on the previous steps. We have developed a felt sense, right, feelings. So I have something very concrete to rest upon. When my mind starts spinning, I can ask, oh, how does it feel? Thinking about food? Oh, probably good. Okay, then I can, I can, use, I can use actually my thinking, right? Another, another myth of the practice, stop thinking, like, yes, sure, great, but we need to, to be able to actually use the thinking skillfully. If uh, stop the thinking means crush the thinking mind, this is a pity. We are losing a powerful tool that, we can, uh, that can help us in the practice. So let's go back. I'm thinking about dinner. And I ask myself, how does it feel? It's like, oh, you know, probably there is associated pleasant, mildly pleasant feeling. But, <laughs> but then I can also question, it's like, well, is, is this the reason why I'm here? Am I meditating so that I can think of dinner and feel this kind of rather limitedly present, pleasant feeling? Well, probably no. It's like, oh, can I, can I master enough you know, energy to overcome? To overcome? Can I uh, focus on what's really my aspiration, why I came to Plum Village in the first place? So, of course, there is a, an active thinking process, right, involved. It's important to, when we were talking before about what is the practice, what is not the practice, if I sit down and I get lost in a daydreaming, this is not useful practice anymore. If I sit down and, and, and I try to crush my mind, just staying with the breath, this is also not the practice. Can I use just enough thinking so that I can actually engage, engage with what's happening. When we go again to the Sampajana, to the parts of uh, recognize where things lead to, what's wholesome, what's unwholesome, it's obvious that there is some, some level of recognition, some level of mental engagement. This is very useful. This is what allows us to grow. If I'm simply aware, simply mindful, it may feel kind of good. Things will drift in front of me and will pass. It's better than a driven mind. It's a spacious mind where things drift. But if I don't recognize them, then I'm missing the opportunity to learn. What allows me to learn is to see, to see what leads to what. To see what's wholesome, to see what's unwholesome, to see what strengthens me, my idea of me and what doesn't, to what creates question, what kind of uh, puts me in a you know, state of like, oh, am I really sure of this? And then there can be even more thinking, you know, I'm working with the hindrances, then I, I can become really actively thinking, kind of engaging with the hindrance to, to question what's inside, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's kind of behind, why is it so uh, appealing to, to dwell in the place, even in an unpleasant place, anger. I can dwell in anger for hours. Oh, why am I doing this? What, what's going on? You know, it doesn't even feel good. At least the dinner part felt good.
there is a sutra that I like it. I think it's called Sutra on Happiness or the Highest Blessing. And it goes through different, uh, different sorts of happiness, different sorts of happiness that we can experience in our life. From the more uh, mundane one, I, I don't remember it now by, by heart, but you know, like having a good education, having a, being skilled in one profession, and then shift towards, you know, more like uh, caring for others, caring for one's family, caring for one relative, and then it moves further, you know, like uh, uh, practicing wholesome action, and and then eventually comes come contact with the practice, uh, being in contact with monastics, uh, practice uh, discussion on the Dharma, and culminates, of course, with liberation. I, I like it because I find it includes two aspects. One is like it doesn't say this is better than that. It says, you know, it's like there is some happiness in this very mundane, basic happiness in life. And it's good to recognize that, you know, like there is happiness in, yeah, we say we have many conditions for happiness. Yes, there is plenty of conditions already now here. And then every, every layer that it moves on is like, it's a deeper sense of happiness. It's a deeper sense of freedom and well-being. I like this because it, I feel it gives a clear direction also for, for practice on the path. It's not like, oh, when I go for alignment and this uh, present situation is terrible, it's like, oh, I can find a lot of joy and happiness in where I'm in right now. And yet, I also have a, a, a moving forward, you know, I, I, I don't just settle for this. I don't want to just settle for what I have. I also want to move in a place of greater understanding, greater love, greater freedom. And it's important to have this balance. If I, I'm only leaning forward, I risk to come from a place of aversion and not acceptance of what, what I have right now. And if I'm only enjoying what's, what's present, I may lack in a sense of moving forward. This, all these instructions, they are for us to explore. There is no right and wrong way of doing things. It's more like we are given all these tools so that we can investigate every moment and every moment of our life and say, where am I in right now? Do I have this balance? Am I balanced enough to feel content with what I have? You know, who I am and the people I'm with and the conditions I have? And yet, also not becoming complacent, not just uh, enjoying what I have and forgetting that I became a monastic to achieve, you know, I'm on this path to learn, to move forward. The Satipatthana itself has many layers that allow us to, to work on these different levels we are at. And... Uh, and we see we come to the practice and maybe we, have some, we, we just need to learn some tools to deal with some, something we are facing in our life. And we do learn. After a while, we learn those tools. I learn to handle my emotions better. I learn to feel more uh, content and independent and better connected with others. And then I learn to give out of generosity and how that feels good. And then I learn to develop a mind that is calm and... And then it's like, oh, uh, is this enough? Or can I, can I continue progressing on the path? Can I start questioning? So there is a level of Satipatthana where is exploration, right? Probing, real, analyzing how things are manifesting, right? I feel an emotion, okay, I go back to the body. How does it feel in the body? I go back to the feelings, oh, okay, what's the felt sense of it? Oh, how does he feel the emotion? You know, mm, okay, I recognize it. Then, uh, then there is moments in uh, in practice where where things become easy. We, we sit down and we feel pretty good. Life is going pretty good. I'm in the sangha for some time. I got my comfort zone. Nobody bothers me. I'm old enough. They don't tell me what to do anymore. Oh, that's great. 
And then, you know, what, how, how do I progress? How do I start to question the basic assumption I have of who I am, what things are, and, and uh, I'll, add, I'll add another little piece in there. Elements. Body parts. And I'll put death. I know I'm not going to go into too much depth in this. Elements, body parts, and death. Um, what I like is is, is the, the forward trust of it. Is the fact that they invite us to to really question to really question the sense of me that I have. To really question. Well, body elements obviously is on the on the body level. You know, you kind of see how the four elements compose this body and and feel the different sensation and associated with elements and see that we are connected with nature and body parts. We do a body scan where we see we 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 recognize the many body parts that compose us. And that's which actually traditionally we say corpse. Uh, we see ourselves as a corpse. And we know, we see, we visualize the court and we remind ourselves that this is also our destiny. One of the difficult parts in practice is not so much, um, or I find it more difficult, is not to work with states of mind that are difficult, but they are like in my face. When I'm in rage, it's not easy. I sit with it, I work with it, you know, eventually it will go. What's more difficult is there is so much of it that, that I'm so used to it that I don't see. There is a basic assumption how reality is, how I am, how things are or should be. And because I'm so used to it, I, I don't even know it's there. So I like this because these elements, they give us some tools to kind of shake things around a little bit, to really kind of say, oh, am I sure? Am I sure I'll stay young forever? And um, probably not. Probably I'll get older and uh, I may actually even die at some point. Well, how, how does it feel? How does it feel to hold the thought in mind? I oh, like the body parts, actually. That's when I, I really enjoy It's like, life is a miracle. That's what it tells me, that the meditation mostly. Like, life is a miracle. This body is a miracle. This mind is a miracle. Do I know it? Am I in touch with it? Or, or am I trapped in some sort of, uh, Again, obtaining what I want, you know, getting what I want from the experience of everyday life. Oh, now I get my nice lunch. Oh, today I like this cooking team. Then I get my nap. Oh, yes, a little bit of work. Okay, no problem. But then eventually, uh, can I can I come out of my comfort zone and really question, really question who I am and what things are? One of the things I like in practice is is to hold the conflicts in front of me and, and like the, the what I would like to have and the what I have and the fact that they don't match and the fact to say, hmm, it's like that. The body, the body is a certain way, right? It's composed of all these elements and then my experience of life is so different how can this brain, this kind of jelly looking thing, create this sense of amazing life experience that we have? I look at an artist there. How can this jelly create this 
painting this masterpiece. Like, wow, I really don't know much about life. It is a mystery. And, and, and the goal of, of, of it all, if you want, is to, to really question our sense of who I am. And then, you may notice, in this, it never says, well, actually, this is you. It talks about all these processes that go on, and this, uh, you know, there's this body, and there's this feeling, and there's this uh, mind, and there's this uh, object of the mind. So where am I? Where am I in all this? One thing I like to do is also to sit with these objects, and, you know, depending you, which one you choose, and, 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 and say, well, Where, where, where am I adding the secret ingredient? You know, where am I adding the me ingredient that kind of gels it up into this solid thing? In other words, what am I attached to? And then I can think of the body that is going to die and, and, and rot. I'm like, wow, am I, am I ready for this? Am I, am I relating to my body with this awareness that actually this is his destiny? Am I relating with my feelings and with the awareness that now it's coming, now it stays for some time, then it goes? Or am I trying to control and manipulate and, and, uh, and, and optimize it? It says, be an island to yourself. And I feel that's our, uh, in a way, it's our task. It's important to be an island to ourselves and um, to, to rely on the practice. It's a necessary tool in order to be, to be an island. If I don't have a clear roadmap, I'll, um, I may get lost. I may think that I'm practicing and I'm not. I may think I'm cultivating something useful, then I'm not. Um, I may lose the, the sense of direction, where, where this, uh, what are we walking toward? So this is the reason I like to share this. I like roadmaps. I like uh, structures, in case you haven't noticed. And, <laughs> and I find it helpful so that we can uh, gauge where we, are, where we are at in this very moment. Again, not to create a, a person out of it that says, oh, this is where I am, I'm a beginner, I'm an expert, but where, where am I right now in my experience? I can place myself somewhere there and, uh, and act accordingly. Oh, what is the most useful tool to use so that I can actually be with what's happening? And if my mind is very peaceful and I feel spacious, oh, I may choose something suitable if I have strong emotions, oh, I may need to come back to feeling or to walk in meditation or to... Um, again, not that it's a way to control, but it's a way to, how do I relate? How do I come in contact with this experience in this moment? Allow it to be and learn something out of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>